Good morning, class. Hope, hope all y'all are doing okay today. Uh, how many, how many weeks have we been meeting like this now? This makes the fifth week. Wow, time passes fast when we're having fun, huh? I uh, don't have many announcements this morning, or really kind of none, but I do, <coughs> I do want to send out a big thank you to our staff and all the work that they've been doing this last five or six weeks. Uh, it's been incredible the way they have pulled together to keep our church together. And when I say church, I mean the people and all the things they've done. The videos, oh boy. They created our own TV station called Arcadia TV on, on uh, YouTube. Uh, I'm surprised by now they haven't gotten us as a network. But uh, we'll take the TV. And I want you to remember that all of our videos, like Sunday morning, our Sunday school classes, Wednesday night, the interviews, the, uh, the, the testimonials that we have, those are all stored on this t uh, Arcadia TV. So if you want to watch them again or refer someone else, your family or friends to them, uh, feel free to do it. They just have to go in there and click on it, and, uh, and they're there. I'd also like to send out a thank you this morning to one of our class members, uh, uh, Pat Power. Pat, you have done a tremendous job keeping our Sunday school class informed about the things that's going on and just kind of keeping us together and making us aware of a lot of the prayer requests that we need to be praying about. Uh, you may think it goes unnoticed, but it doesn't. We really appreciate what you do, so just keep up the good work. Today, we're going to be in Romans 8, uh, and verses 10 and 11, Paul makes it clear that Christ gives life to, to believers. And this is the key thought that too often has been lost in the debate over the role of the Holy Spirit. But Paul wasn't teaching Holy Spirit uh, theology. Rather, he was talking about relationally and positionally. Christ, Christ must be in us and us in Him. For the, for the Spirit to live in us means that it's not just an occasional thing, something we can pick and choose whenever we want, but it's something that's there all the time, and God is the rule, and He lives within us. Our status is in Christ, and in the Spirit, when we set our minds to think the spiritual, uh, those who are in Christ they must act and live as though they belong to Christ. Uh, Paul's today in our, in our Sunday school lesson is going to bring out the implications of Christ's given life. So let's have a word of prayer and then we'll jump into our lesson. Father God, we're just uh, thankful today for all the things that you've given us these last five weeks, the way you've taken care of us, the way you, you've uh, kept us well and safe from the virus that's going through this world. Father, we thank you for the staff who brings us together, keeps us together, and the things that uh, you put in their minds to do. Where they get the ideals, Father, to do some of these things, just, just busts. It, it's just incredible. We thank you, Father, for the wisdom you give them. Keep them safe from all types of evils, and they may continue to serve you by serving us. And Father, we just ask that you be with us now as we study uh, your word in Romans, that we study about the Holy Spirit, and we study about the, the being in bondage to, to their flesh. Father, we ask for understanding, and Father, we ask that you just open our hearts to your word. And Father, we want to lift up to you, to you today all of those that's got special needs in their lives. I know we can't call out to each other the prayer requests that we have in our hearts and the needs that we have, but you know each and every one of them, Father. We just ask that you that you touch each one that has some type of special need, whether it's sickness or illnesses or or anxieties or fears or whatever it may be, Father, you're, you know what those needs are. We just we just lift them up to you. And it's in Christ's name we ask these many things. Amen. Romans 8, uh, verse 12 through 13, tells us that we're debtors. I'll read it. Therefore, brothers and sisters, we have an obligation, but it is not to the flesh to live according to it. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the misdeeds of the body, you will live. We're de debtors. There's no doubt there, but we're not debtors to flesh. We can't live according to the flesh. But obviously we're in debt to someone. So I'll give you one guess who that is. Christ Jesus. He's the one that died for us on the cross. And we're, we're in debt to the Spirit who gives us life 
dead to the flesh. So if we're in debt to the spirit, we cannot be under obligation to the flesh. We can't enslave ourselves to the flesh and all of its desires. And we can't be under the control of the flesh, not if we're indebted to the Holy Spirit. Uh, you know, in the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus prayed to God to, to remove the cup from him. What he was praying for, and the reason he was praying was, he knew that when he died on that cross to take all of our sins to the grave, that he'd be separated from, from his Father, from God. God can't be where there's sin. Well, when we live in debt to the flesh, we're separated from God. Uh, we don't have life in the Spirit if we're indebted to the flesh. But we're dead in our sins. We can't live with our eyes focused on this physical world. Think of all the things out there in the world today that just wait to put you in slavery. Uh, abortion, slavery, alcohol, adultery, murders, thievery. Uh, you can lie and you can just go on and on. The list is long. Uh, of all the things out there just waiting for us to take our eyes off of Christ and, and, and put them on the flesh. So we can't be focused on the concerns of this life. Uh, our mind has to be set on the Spirit and, if, and our focus has to be on the things of God. Therefore, we must put to death the deeds of the flesh. That can't be our hope, our life any longer. And this is what Paul has summarized in, in the, uh, the first half of Romans 8 as well as the whole chapter 6 in Romans. So going into verse 14, we start talking about the family of God. And I'll read it. For those who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. The Spirit you receive does not make you slaves so that you live in fear again. Rather, the Spirit you received brought about your adoption to sonship. And by Him, we cry, Abba, Father, the Spirit Himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Now, if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ, if indeed we share in the sufferings in order that we may also share in His glory. Now, Paul continues his message of assurance. Uh, those who are led by the Spirit are sons of God. You know, God called Israel His son and called Himself Israel's father. Back in Exodus, uh, chapter 4 verse 22 it says then say to Pharaoh this is what the Lord says Israel is my firstborn son the first intent you know this paints a really a, a good picture of, of who according to the spirit by setting their minds on the spirit are the people of God and they are true Israel this is the point that Paul made earlier in Romans uh, in chapter 2 that when he said, those who seek after God, give their alliance to God, are the sons of God, the true Israel. Not only this, but, but calling those who are led by the Spirit sons of God shows they're part of God's family. God is the Father, and we are His children. Being in the Spirit and the Spirit being in us means that God is in charge of our lives. The assurance we have is that we're God's children. We've been admitted into the family of God. What this declared status of child or son of God uh, means that there are privileges that come from that position. And we read in Galatians 4 uh, verses 6 through 7, Because you are his sons, God sent his spirit, the spirit of his son, into our hearts. The spirit who calls out Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave. God's child. And since you are his child, God has made you also an heir. You know, Romans 15, uh, 8 15 becomes very, uh, very clear that we are not slaves to fall back into fear. Uh, Paul talked about slavery all through Romans. And Paul has shown that we are slaves uh, and, and to sin and slaves to the law of Moses. Uh, we're not, we are not enslaved to those things that we should fall back in fear. Uh, remember that we learned that uh, the law of Moses enslaved people because they could not obey the law. Well, the law reveals sin but does not offer a justification. People were under the scourge of sin because they couldn't obey the law. 
and the law had no provisions for life. So all were enslaved. But that's not the situation anymore. People are no longer enslaved to the law of Moses. What we've received in Jesus is not, a, not the status of slaves, but rather what we have received in Jesus is the status of sons. Paul says we did not receive slavery, but we received adoption. And adoption signifies being granted the full rights and privileges of sonship, sonship in a family to which one does not belong by nature. Our, nature, our natural state is slavery. That's because of our actions. But God has adopted us because of his own righteousness and his actions. To show how special this relationship is with God, Paul says that we cry, Abba, Father. Who is the only person to call God Father? Who's the only person to call God Abba, Father? Jesus. We not only have the status as sons, but we have the heart of sons. We're not slaves. Paul's not teaching something mystical here. He's teaching something relational. Uh, to have the status as sons, we have access to the Father so that we can cry out to Him anytime. Paul extends our assurance further that the Spirit testifies with, this, with our spirit that we are children of God. Well, if Paul means that the Holy Spirit makes you feel good and happy and just bubbly all the time, well, that's not, that's not, that doesn't work for me. Uh, it may work for some, but it, it doesn't work for me. I, I often feel pretty lousy when I stand in front of God because of uh, what I've done, maybe the life I live, my errors, my mistakes, uh, my sins. Uh, but, but thankfully, the Spirit does not testify to our spirit through feelings because that would just be too subjective. What Paul is teaching is when I set my mind on the things of the Spirit and Christ is living in me, then the Spirit through the Spirit, I know that I'm a child of God. Even though I don't live perfectly. Even though I come up short, do not feel good about myself all the time uh, because of my sins, I know that I'm a son of God. And because of that, I'm not enslaved to sin. God has ruled my life, and He's provided a way for forgiveness uh, that the law of Moses never could. First, 17 adds to our assurance. If we're children of God, then we are heirs of God. This is the picture of inheritance. We will receive the full reality of all that God has promised when Christ returns. We're going to receive the inheritance. Not only this, but we are fellow heirs with Christ. Uh, we've been adopted as children, been given the status of justified, and we're in a relationship with God as our Father and Christ as our brother. What better position to be in? You know, the writer of Hebrews makes a similar point that Paul is making here in Hebrews 2, 9 through 11. But we see him who for a little while was made lower than the angels, namely Jesus, crowned with glory and honor because of the suffering of death, so that by the grace of God he might taste death for everyone. For it was fitting that he for whom and by whom all things exist in bringing many sons to glory should make the founder of their salvation perfect through suffering. For he who uh, sanctifies and those who are sanctified all have one source. That is why he is not ashamed to call them brothers. What a privilege, what a blessing. But notice the conditional statement in verse 17. Provided we suffer with him. This glorification and blessing will only happen if we suffer with Him. To share in the glory of Christ means sharing in the sufferings of Christ. And to share in the inheritance with Christ means to suffer loss with Christ. Paul says that the Christian life is not going to be easy when we live according to the Spirit and not according to the flesh. We suffer in order that we may also share in His glory. It's an interesting statement. Paul is, Paul is not questioning if we will suffer. The point is that if we're Christians, we will suffer. 
To be dead in sin will bring sacrifices and suffering. To present our members of our body uh, as instruments to righteousness will bring suffering. Verse 18, it contains some good news. The present suffering are minimal when compared to the future glorification. Well, that's not exactly what Paul said. Paul said that our suffering is not worth comparing with the glory that's going to be revealed to us when Christ comes again. Uh, we like to compare our sufferings. We like, we like to compare a lot of things. But uh, we always have to have to be one up on, on our buddy, on our friend. Uh, you think your day was tough? You should follow me around today. You've been up since 5 o'clock in the morning? Shoot, by 5 o'clock I'd already shower, shave, ate breakfast, and read the newspaper. Always got to have one up on it. Uh, we also compare our, if our sacrifices were worth it. But consider the thought. The suffering at this present time is not even worth comparing to the glory that's going to be revealed when Jesus Christ comes back. We lose sight of this sometimes. It's a, it's a suffering that causes us to stop serving God and stop worshiping God. But we're not looking at the glory that's going to be revealed when Jesus Christ comes back. Paul also talks about the creation and how it uh, eagerly anticipates the, the revealing, the second coming, when Christ comes back and makes everything new. Uh, we shouldn't be thrown off that, uh, that Paul's talking about the creation and, and he kind of personifies it. Uh, Paul has personified sin all through Roman and he personifies the, uh, uh, the creation to focus on the eagerness. And Paul uses personification of creation to say even it longs eagerly for the moment of glorification. We should be eagerly anticipating that moment also even though we're suffering with Him. You know, sometimes if, we, if we're suffering with Jesus, with God, we don't look like we're sons of God. I mean, our suffering uh, doesn't look like we're being glorified. But you know, when Christ was hanging on that cross all bloody and beat up, naked. And, uh, he didn't look much like the Son of God either, did he? But you know, three days later when he rolled that stone back, walked out of that tomb in a clean, white robe, sandals, everybody knew he was the Son of God. And you know, at the end time, on the last day, everybody's going to publicly know that we're sons of God's too. Through all that suffering, we didn't look too much like it. It'll be revealed. Paul reminds us that, that the creation was subject, subjected to futility. This points back to Genesis 3 when, when the creation was cursed because of Adam's sin. <clears throat> we, we read about that back in Romans 5. Sin affects everything. But Adam's sin, his transgression, was not like those who came after him. Adam's transgression affected the whole world. It changed the whole world. And everybody, everything is awaiting the glorious revealing, the second coming of Jesus, when everything will be put back the way it was, back before there was sin, back when everything was brand spanking new. The point of, of focus shouldn't be on the creation, but that, that everything is longing for the second coming. Everything is longing for the revealing. You know, the creation is just, it's used as a parallel to us. It's just telling us how the creation is longing to be set free of the bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of glory. Uh, if creation longs for this, we, we certainly must long for it too. We must eagerly await for it. And Paul says that we groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for our adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. This is similar to Paul's words to the Corinthians and uh, 2 Corinthians 5, 2 when he said, For in this tent we groan, longing to put on our heavenly dwellings. Perhaps another way to look at this is, uh, uh, is the way Paul groaned earlier in Romans. In Romans 7, 24, he, he says, Wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? And then when he went on to, to say in 2 Corinthians, he who has prepared us for this very thing is God, who has given us the Spirit as a guarantee. <coughs> I 
in some in the same way Paul is saying that we have Paul is saying that we have some of the first fruits. Uh, this includes many things that was given through the Spirit. The miraculous spiritual gifts were one piece of the first fruits of the Spirit. The blessings of God that we have in Christ is a portion. The new covenant that we are under is is part of the down payment of the Spirit. The kingdom that we're partakers in is another portion that we have now. And the restored relationship with the Father through Christ was promised by the Holy Spirit. These are just a few things uh, that uh, that we have as a down payment until the second revealing. So we grow for adoption. This is interesting because we've already studied verse 15 that we've received adoption. However, Paul says that we're waiting for adoption. Well, in one sense, we've already received it. Uh, we've received our adoption because we've been brought into God's family. In another sense, we're still waiting for our adoption because we do not enjoy all the privileges of sonship yet. We eagerly anticipate receiving the full rights as adopted children of God. In verse 24 it says, For in this, in this hope we were saved. We have something to look forward to. We haven't been given everything yet. Uh, Father, we've not seen all this glorification. What's it going to be? 2 Corinthians 2, 9 through 10 says, No eye is seen. No ear is heard and no mind has conceived of all the things that God has for those who love Him. We have no idea what that glorification is going to be. So that is our hope that is seen, that is not seen. Uh, for hope that is seen is not hope. Uh, we're hoping for things that we do not know, that we do not see. No mind has conceived and no eye has seen. We can't, can't be focused on worldly things because we'll lose that hope and what we haven't seen. Uh, present service uh, suffers. It will take us away from waiting eagerly for the future glorifications. Uh, Paul tells us in verse 25 that we wait for it in endurance and patience. So we groan inwardly as we wait for this glory, our full rights as adopted children. You know, to refresh this a little bit, we're debtors but not to flesh. We're debtors to the Holy Spirit. The flesh cannot be our master. We're not slaves, but we're sons. This is just a few of the things that we've, we've covered. Uh, a close relationship with God is available. We can cry out to God as our dear Father. We can say, I have a Father, anytime we want. We're not only sons, but we're heirs of the promise and an inheritance to come. But we will suffer as children of God. The present sufferings that we do can't be compared to the glory that's going to come. Uh, anybody have any questions? Uh, if you have any questions or any concerns or need anything, uh, email the office at afbcoffice at arcadiafbc.org. That's the lesson today, and we'll close with a word prayer. Father God, we're just thankful that uh, we can call ourselves sons of God. We, we're just thankful, Father, that... that uh, the blessings we receive today through our our belief, our worship of you, so Father, the blessings we receive through the Holy Spirit because we trust in you and we trust in, in Jesus Christ. These blessings are, are just so new compared to the blessings that we're going to receive when Jesus comes again and we receive the full inheritance of sonship. Father, we just uh, pray now for those who, who are at home and, and uh, just pray, Father, for the day that uh, we can all be back together in class together. Father, we ask all these things in Christ's name. Amen. There is one more thing I'd like to say. Friday night, good Friday uh, evening, we had uh, Lord's Supper up here. I hope all of y'all came up. We had a uh, little over 200 people take communion. Not sure of the exact count, but I know it was over 200. Uh, it's a great thing the staff's doing, and when you see them, send them a card or something. Say thank you. Uh, see y'all next Sunday.